I'll put with the uh, with the helmets, by the way. Yeah, uh, yeah, I'm gonna do that again. So, all right, hello everyone, and welcome to LA Ram Central. This is episode 84. Uh, we are doing the divisional playoff game this week, and <clears throat> <coughs> forgive me for the coughing. I'm fighting a cold, but um, all it is is a cough, and I'm fine with that. Uh, big weekend. Uh, we find out who the final four of the NFL are, and for the divisional pl- for the wild card round, me and Eric. Uh, well, I went two and two. Eric, what was your record? Two and two. Yeah, so we were both 500 at the moment. So um, we really got disappointed with a couple of games there, but to each their own. So without further ado. You saw there it was the Eagles and the Falcons. Um, Atlanta's the favorite going into Philly for obvious reasons. Two words, Nick Foles. Uh, I can't say I necessarily uh, blame the experts for picking. Uh, The Philadelphia Eagles have a really good front four. Um, Their linebacking core to me is suspect. Their secondary is inconsistently consistent in the sense that they have big games and they don't have big games. They can play well. They got a lot of playmakers back there, but they're just inconsistent. I don't like the Julio Jones matchup for any one of the Eagles secondary. Um, but to me, the bottom line is this is where the Eagles are going to miss Peters. I think the key to this game, it, it really, and I'm not even going to do a key for each team this week. I'm just going to do the keys to the game. Uh, and it's going to be the ability to put pressure on the quarterback with your front four. The ability of the quarterback to step into the pocket and make the tough throw in turnovers uh, because pressure can create turnovers and the quarterback staying in the pocket can create turnovers. But I'm going to throw a fourth one in this game, and I think it's going to be the quarterback play. I think it's a tall order to expect Nick Foles, whose track record is not good, to be expected to step in in a big game and step up and play. Now, if they can run the ball, that's going to alleviate a lot of their concern. I got the Falcons winning this game 26 16, 27-16, sorry. Um, I just think Atlanta has too many weapons. I think the running game is going to be able to eventually break through that Philadelphia defense. Uh, The Eagles' defense has not been the same that it's been all year long over the last few weeks, and that quarterback position is a big reason why. Their defense is going to need massive turnovers to make the thing happen. I think Atlanta goes back to their conference championship game, and at least one of the teams I picked to go to the Super Bowl is still going to be playing. That's my call. Your call, Lee? Philadelphia is a very interesting game, and, and you hit it on the head with uh, Vegas um, basically, you know, uh, picking the Falcons uh, to win this game. It's for six seed to be favored over a one seed uh, <laughs> uh, going into the division round. Now, uh, my three keys to the game for Philadelphia, I'm, I'm going to make this simple: Nick Foles, Nick Foles, Nick Foles. Uh, he does have. One, he, he has two uh, postseason appearances. One in which he played, which was back in 2003 for the Eagles. Went 23 of 33 for 195 yards, two touchdowns. No picks, no fumbles. Um, he also got into the game last year with Kansas City, but didn't, re- didn't really record any stats. So I'm guessing he just either handed the ball off or, or, um, or just put the knee to... Uh, Actually, no, he had no rush. He had no rush, so uh, probably just handed the ball off a couple times. I think uh, he finished that game. However, when he first came onto the scene for Philly this past season, his first game was tremendous, and he kept getting worse ever since. Now, that would be a big red flag to me going into the playoffs, especially when in Week 17 you play one or two series, your numbers are awful, and then you have a week off. Now, you can't simulate game action in practice. You have two weeks off. There's a lot of rust. There's not a lot of uh, not a lot of reps going, not a lot of game uh, reps going your way. I mean, you're getting all the practice reps, and that's great. But what does your, what does your, uh, what's your situation like with Zach Kurtz? What's your uh, connection like with, Alshon Jeffrey, because they need to get Alshon Jeffrey involved early and often. 
I think he's got good rapport with Mel Stagel already. Uh, so he just needs to keep working on that. But this game comes down to Nick Foles and how he handles the pressure. Uh, I think the Falcons' defense is legit. I think if they stick to the run game with Freeman and Coleman, I think they're going to they're, they're gonna be day okay. And that line, the way he played last week, he plays this week. Uh, throwing to Julio Jones and he's got Austin Hooper over the middle. It, it, it could be... It, this has the makings of a high scoring affair. However, I think with the elements, it's going to limit the Falcons a little bit, especially now going uh, to to the cold instead of being in you know sunny and warm uh, LA last week. Um, Atlanta's doing it. Uh, Anthony called it. I mean, they're, they're two games away, so they win this game. You know, they're in the championship game. But uh, I like the Falcons a uh, close one, twenty four twenty three. We got a one point game. This game, I'm going to let you take first, E. Go ahead. Okay. I think, I think things are already working against the Titans. They were sitting on their plane on the tarmac yesterday for more than two hours before they took off because of bad weather. That gets in their head. I think that I think that has to take it over the mental hurdle there. What the Tennessee Titans do, they, they present a very interesting game uh, against the Patriots. Because not only do you have a very mobile quarterback, which sometimes the Patriots do have trouble with, but they also got a bruising running back who can make tacklers hurt. And the Patriots defense is right for Derrick Henry picking. Um, so I think Derrick Henry goes off. I think, he's, I think he has a good game. I think he has a game like last week against uh, last week against Chiefs. The problem with the Titans is they don't have the offense capable to put up points in a hurry like New England does. You're going to see Gronk have a huge game on the opposite side of the ball. What Tennessee needs to do, they need to get to Brady early often. Can't them get him on the ground because that gets him flustered. We've seen it before, and I, I, I won't be surprised if we see it again. Uh, the Titans just need, to, just need to keep pressure on the ball. No turnovers. Don't expect another Mariota uh, Mario to touchdown pass to himself, uh, but expect Delaney Walker to have a big day down the middle for them. If if Mariota can hit him and not and not throw interceptions, yeah, I think this is this is his limelight right now, and he wants to take full advantage. On the Patriots side of the ball, they're not going to have Burkhead or Gillespie, so their run game is going to take a semi hit. But Deion Lewis has been huge for them this year, if, if and when Burkhead is as this game. So if Lewis and White can shoulder the load and take a little pressure off Brady, Brady has Hogan, he's got Amendola, he's got Gronk, he's got Brandon Cooks. Brady's got a lot of weapons at his disposal. And I'm not sure the Titans have enough to slow them down. I'm looking at the Patriots with a 31 to 19 victory in this game. Well, I think first of all, I don't think that is going to get the Titans' head. I think playing in Foxborough is going to get the Titans' heads. It seems to get in every opponent's head. The key to this game is the who runs is the who wins. If Tennessee runs the ball, they're going to win. If New England stops the run. They're going to win. Because the Patriots can win one-dimensional. They've proven that. Um, and they are a one-dimensional football team. That is one of the most one-dimensional franchises I think I've ever seen over the long haul in my life. Uh, they have an occasional 1,000-yard rusher here and there. But for the most part, their leading rusher is somewhere in the five 600 range. It's passing all the time. Um, so if Tennessee can run, they can win. If New England could stop the run, they're going to win. Ultimately... I think Tennessee's going to need to get something out of their defense. Um, they're going to need to get stops on third down. Third down's going to be the key down for both of these teams. Can the Titans extend the drive on third down, and can they stop the Patriots on third down? Um, turnovers is always going to be a key in a playoff game. You turn the ball over at Foxborough in New England, you're done. So the key to this game is run, convert third down, and get turnovers if you're Tennessee. If you're New England, it's stop the run, 
convert third down, and create turnovers. Ultimately, I think New England's going to do that. I think the Patriots are going to win this football game. I think they're going to win it rather handily. Uh, I'm going to say 31-7, 31-13. I don't think it's going to be much of a football game um, because I I don't believe that Tennessee is going to be able to run the ball like they did last week. If they do, Eric, the Titans will win this game. If, If Henry has 150 yards rushing, the Titans are going to win the football game. It's as simple as that. So um, I don't anticipate that happening. I think the Patriots will shut it down, force them to throw early because they're going to have a big lead, maybe because of turnovers, nerves, whatever. But I got the Patriots win this one 31-13. All right, so next up, Eric, I've got the Steelers and the Jacksonville Jaguars. Um, so let me start over with that one. So next up, I got the Steelers and the Jacksonville Jaguars, Eric, I'll go ahead and again, let you go ahead and take your Homer team first. Go. Oh, you're funny. (laughs) All right. This, uh, the Steelers Jaguar game is a rematch from earlier in the season where the Jaguars dismantled the uh, Steelers, uh, 30 to nine. This was after a lot of, um, promotion and, talking about standing for the national anthem. So the Steelers had to work where they should have been for this game, but Jacksonville's defense didn't do them any favors. They picked off Roethlisberger five times, and they, they had themselves up at, uh, uh, they had themselves a game up in up at Heinz Field. Well, now the Jacksonville Jaguars return. Problem is, Blake Bortles isn't playing his best, best football at this point. Now, that could change. Uh, Five-yard out passes were dropping incomplete. Uh, you know, very simple uh, passes that he was throwing to uh, to his receivers just weren't getting there. He was off target. That's not a recipe for success in the playoffs. Uh, no Ryan is here in this game, as we know. Uh, he had been injured uh, since, uh, I want to say, week 11. So that's going to open up some running lanes for Leonard Fournette. Jacksonville can control the ball. All Bortles has to do, I don't expect him to have a, a running game like he had last week against Buffalo, uh, but if Bortles can hit uh, on his passes and the defense shows up again, it's going to be one heck of a game. Uh, I think with Pittsburgh, you know, they, they have an explosive offense. Uh, I think Ben's out for revenge. Brown should be back uh, after coming off the uh, injury that he had against the Patriots. Uh, I believe that was week 15. So he's back for his uh, calf injury. And uh, Le'Veon Bell is going to be a good course. That being said, as those were my keys to the game on both sides of the ball, Pittsburgh's defense is vulnerable. You can run on Pittsburgh's defense. I am going with Jacksonville in this game. Very close. 20 to 17. Wow. You went a direction I didn't anticipate. Um... Well, I bet, you know, I've been mulling this game over all week. And I'm like, I, I, I'm, I'm excited for this game. I can't wait to watch this game. If Pittsburgh wins and blows out Jacksonville, I'm not going to be surprised, okay? But I think with the way Jacksonville has been playing, I know they lost two of the last two games of the season and won a defensive game last week. Not pretty offensively, but, you know, Bortles, Bortles threw the pass that he needed to when the time mattered. And they're going to learn from that. I know Pittsburgh's watching a ton of tape on Jacksonville, just vice versa as well, Jacksonville and Pittsburgh, to see how they've changed from when they played, how they were playing at the end of the season. They're week 17 out for Pittsburgh because really it didn't count. They were, they were playing all the backups. But show that, show the Patriot game, show the game week 16. And I think Jacksonville has a defense to where they can limit big plays by Roethlisberger. And watching Jalen Ramsey on Antonio Brown is going to be one for the ages. Well, for me, the key to this game really is the running game. Um, Unlike the Patriot game where the Patriots had to stop the run to win, they don't necessarily have to run the ball to win. Pittsburgh has to run the ball to win. If you're one-dimensional against Jacksonville, and that one dimension happens to be their best dimension on defense, which is getting to the quarterback, you're done. Now, you may get Antonio Brown with 175 yards receiving and a touchdown, but that ain't going to be enough to beat Jacksonville. Jacksonville can run the ball. No Shazier. 
when they had Shazier, he they got torched by the Jacksonville running game. Now they don't have him. Um, I've not been impressed with the with the Steelers secondary all year long. Um, and I do think that Blake Bortles will find success against that defense in getting the ball completed downfield. So I, I actually think this game's gonna be also in favor of Jacksonville. Again, the key to this game is simple: run the ball. You'll know early. By the second quarter, you know who you're gonna know who's gonna win this game because it's the team that's having the most effective running game going on. Both teams should have success through the air. So for me, I think Jacksonville is going to be able to run the ball more, keep the ball out of uh, Ben Roethlisberger's hands. And when Ben doesn't have the ball a lot, he pushes and he presses. So when he gets the ball and he's down 10-0, they're going to be able to get to him because he's not a mobile quarterback. They're going to be able to get him down to the ground because they've gotten everybody down to the ground. He's going to get his big completions to Antonio Brown, but that's only going to take you so far. I got Jacksonville winning this game 27-17 maybe 27-13. I think the Steelers will get a touchdown and go for two. I don't think they'll get it. So I do think they'll score two touchdowns in this game. But I got Jacksonville winning because I think Leonard Fournette's going to have over 100 yards rushing. I think Blake Bortles is going to have over 200 yards passing. And I think the Jaguars defense is going to get between three to four sacks in this game. And I think that their secondary is going to probably get a pick or two. And that's going to be the difference of the game, uh, killing two drives and ending it right then and there. So I also have Jacksonville winning and advancing to the conference championship game in 2017. Next up. I would, uh, oh, go I, ahead. I would expect, I, I would expect Le'Veon Bell to run a lot of outside runs, not between the tackles. When they met the first time as well, Anthony, remember, Jacksonville didn't have Marcel Darius. Yeah. When you put a big key Todd right there in the middle, Le'Veon Bell is not running up the middle at all. No. And that makes the running game one dimensional, which is really difficult. See, when you run the ball, you have three dimensions you want to you want to you want to be able to access outside running lane, inside running lane, and what I call inside outside running lanes, which are basically off guard between guard and tackle. Your inside running game is between the guards. Your inside outside running game is is outside the guards, and then your outside running game is obviously off tackle off end. And when you're one dimensional and you can only go offside off tackle off end, uh, it's going to be a problem for Pittsburgh for sure. I agree. This game, I've been going back and forth on all week, and I'm not even convinced of my pick this week. Um, I'm going to go first here. I think the Minnesota Vikings' most underrated player on the football team is Latavius Murray. He has been not only a bell cow, but he has been brutal on, on defenses on third and short. The guy's ability to get third and one, third and two on the ground has been second to none in football in 2017. He is auto friggin matic since he took over the starting running back position. Case Keenum has benefited from this because it's not always going to be a short completion for Case Keenum on third and two. They could pick it up on the ground. Case Keenum has played incredible, incredible, incredible football. Now we've looked at a lot of these games. Atlanta has played Philadelphia before in the postseason. Um, they played him in 1978. Um, or 1979, yeah, 1978, and they lost, um, or they won, I'm sorry, and advanced. They played uh, They played them again. I'm pretty sure they played them at least once or twice um, since then. Um, you know, obviously Jacksonville-Pittsburgh has played each other in the postseason. I think Jacksonville's beat them a couple of times, if not once. These two teams have played each other in the postseason twice. 1987, the Vikings blew New Orleans out 44-10 in, in New Orleans. In the year New Orleans won the Super Bowl, was that 09? That was 09, yeah. In 09, they won that overtime game where uh, Brett Favre inexplicably threw the pick and the Saints were able to go on and win the Super Bowl. Um, This is a a good matchup. It's a good game. These are two teams with a history. But I'm going to go – what ultimately did it for me is I'm going to go with the history here. New Orleans historically – doesn't just get beat by Minnesota, they get blown out by the Vikings, and they don't have a very good head-to-head record. I know this is different, and I know the Saints have Drew Brees, and I know they have Kamara, and I know they have Ingram, but the Vikings have something I have not seen since the 2000 Ravens. 
They have potential Hall of Famers at every single level on defense. Xavier Rhodes, as good as he is, Terrence Newman has played phenomenal. A guy I thought the Rams should have drafted a few years ago, and instead they went a different direction. That could have been a Ram. Um, but for me, he's been an unsung hero on that defense. Linebackers, you've got Barr, who's playing out of his mind this year and playing not just at a Pro Bowl level, but playing at a high level. You've got those two defensive tackles. It presents a challenge. Now, I remember watching the Rams-Saint game, and apparently everyone's forgotten about this game this year. But what the Rams were able to do is limit New Orleans' running game and get pressure on the quarterback. And that's exactly what the Vikings can do. The difference between, I think, Minnesota and anybody else New Orleans has seen is their quarterback no one takes seriously because they don't believe what they're seeing from him. And their running back no one even acknowledges is as good as he is because they don't even think about him. Then you've got Thielen, or Thielen, you've got Diggs, you've got Rudolph. I, I think the key to this game, I'm going to go with New Orleans first. In order for New Orleans to win this game, they better stop Latavius Murray on third and short. They better get turnovers off of Case Keenum in, in the air. And number three, they better protect Drew Brees and give him time to find the open receiver. For Minnesota, do your thing. Put pressure on the quarterback, run Murray, and continue for Case Keenum to play Case Keenum type football, at least 2017 Case Keenum football. I actually think Minnesota is going to win this game. I think the Vikings are going to pull the upset, if that's such a thing. I know they're favored. But I think a lot of people, a lot of pundits are picking New Orleans. I actually think the Vikings are going to win this game. And I think it's going to be a low-scoring game. I think it's going to be like a 24-10, 24-14 kind of game. But I'm going Minnesota over New Orleans to advance to the conference championship game. They just have too much talent on that defense side of the ball. They made a believer out of me. And Case Keenum, as bad as I know he is, he's not playing that way this year. I got the Vikings winning 24-14, E, you. Yeah, Minnesota is 2-1 uh, uh, versus Saints in the playoffs all time. Obviously, they lost their last game to New Orleans before this matchup. Uh, back in 09, of course, the punch arm thrown across his body. Uh, I believe he was picked off by uh, Darren Sharp, if I, if I remember correctly. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, listen, in order for the Saints, what I think would be an upset for them to go to Minnesota and beat the Vikings, would they would need to stick with their, their plan from the whole year on. They need to do to the Vikings what they did when they went to Buffalo. And that is to run it down their throats, Kamara breaks one, Ingram breaks one, they need everything to go right for them. Uh, they met in week one. Uh, Bradford led the uh, left east to victory. The teams... Okay, it was early in the season week one. A lot of changes have happened. She's keen to go over for the Vikings after Bradford went down. Um, the Wallace has pretty much been the same team. They just got they, they just started clicking after week two. You know, they had two tough games, then all of a sudden, hey, you know what? This is how we're going to play, and we're going to keep going with it, and we're going to lean on our, run, on our uh, running offense and, and not as much as Drew Brees. Well, Drew Brees last week threw for 376 yards. Drew Brees is going to probably revert back to himself, but the Saints need Kamara and Ingram to be heavily involved. Listen, the matchups to watch in this game are actually corners on receivers. Marshawn Lattimore is going to be on Stephon Diggs, and Xavier Rhodes is going to be on Michael Thomas. Whoever has the better game between those two is going to win the game. Kevin Thielen is such a weapon. Kyle Rudolph is huge for uh, Minnesota. The, the Saints have been wanting that to be Kobe Fleener, but it's more like Josh Hill, but he only catches a few, uh, a few passes of the game. So a lot of dump-offs to Kamara, a lot of running with Ingram, uh, and a home run ball to Ted Ginn Jr. because there's going to be no Brandon Coleman for the Saints in this game. On the Vikings side of the ball, Case Keenan does not have to force the ball anywhere. Hand off to Murray, screw the pass to McKinnon, let them do their thing. Case Keenan, take a couple of shots down the field, uh, open up that defense a little bit. Uh, I see the Vikings winning this game 31 to 20. Wow. Okay. So very similar. All right. Let's wrap. I think 
I also think this is going to be one of the most fascinating games to watch all weekend. <clears throat> Repeat that, Eric. I said that I think this is going to be one of the most fascinating games to watch all weekend. Yeah, I, 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 I agree. This is actually the one game I am recording. Uh, to add to my collection, I'm expecting it to be that good. I'm not recording Jacksonville Pittsburgh because I fully expect that either the officials could completely ensure that it's a Patriot Steeler championship game again, or Jacksonville has a potential to take a dump. It could be any one of those things. They obviously could win, but I don't. I don't anticipate that. A lot of coaching changes have come down the pike. O'Brien re-signed with uh, Houston, so it doesn't look like he's going to Arizona. Um, I had heard I'd heard a rumor, and I don't know how true it is, that Nick Saban said he wanted to go to Arizona. I don't know how true that is, considering the source I heard it from is a very not a good source. Belichick to to the New York Giants, I still think is intriguing and could happen. Um, I think Patricia's going to end up in Detroit, and I think that Josh McScandles is probably going to end up in Indianapolis. That's what my gut tells me. Uh, although I wouldn't be surprised if Patricia ended up in New York and Belichick stayed in New England. Um, but as far as coaching changes, obviously John Gruden is back in Oakland. I think we talked about that already. If we didn't, um, let me just tell you I'm excited about that. I think that's good for the Raiders. Um, and it's an opportunity to right a wrong that should never have happened to begin with. Um, and I'm glad to see that Gruden still acknowledges that the tuck rule was a bogus rule to make sure the Patriots got to the, got to the Super Bowl because obviously officials had bet on New England in that game. Um, and I'm glad that he acknowledged the fact that that was a bogus call, even all these years later. Um, I'm trying to think what I mean, Chicago. We talked about the Bears' new coach, right? Uh, I mean, I, we touched on it. I don't think that they had hired anybody last time we talked. Uh, I can't remember, but uh, the the Bears hired uh, former Kansas City Chiefs offensive coordinator Matt Nagy. Um, basically, you know, there were there were going back and forth Kansas City who was calling the plays when who was calling the plays during the playoff game or whatnot. The only thing that really concerns me with Matt Nagy is he's from the Andy Reid coaching tree, and yeah, I can already, I can already see that uh, you know, game managing and, and, and game calling could be an issue down the line. Uh, I'm just curious to see how he's going to do this first year. Uh, the Bears retained their defensive coordinator, Big Fangio, which he was supposed uh, he was supposed to test the market, but. Uh, he had a lot of interest from Green Bay. I'm glad he didn't go there. Uh, Green Bay ended up hiring. Green Bay made a lot of changes uh, to their to their staff. They actually hired former Cleveland Browns head coach Mike Keen to run their defense. Uh, they changed up their front office. They have a new GM. Ted Thompson's out. Um, and then with the Bears, they hired. And he won't call plays. But they hired former Oregon Ducks head coach Mark Helfrich, which they have two young guys in Helfrich and Nagy to work with Mitch Trubisky, which I think is huge. Yeah. But as I was telling someone the other day, that you could have you could have Vince Lombardi as your head coach, you could have the best offensive and defensive coordinator. You need the players around him to be successful. Okay. The Bears are starting where they need to as far as getting the coaches in line. But what they need to do, they need to make sure that they get the players to give Trubisky weapons. Now, that's going to be hard to come by. And I say that because there were three wide receivers who were, who looked to hit the market in free agency. Devontae Adams, he re-signed with Green Bay. Uh, Sammy Watkins, what it looks like uh, uh, news out of Rams camp is that they're going to franchise tag him. And that leaves Jarvis Landry, a uh, slot receiver from the Dolphins. And, you know, do you throw a lot of money at that lead? Because he's going to command a lot. Because there's not a lot of receivers like him that are out there. But my thing is, go after Jimmy Graham. He can help, he can help fill that hole left by Zach Miller. Uh, he'd be able, to, he'd be able to, to run freely down the field. But Deion Sims blocked. Get Adam Shaheen involved. You know, that's fine that you have three tight ends. Sometimes you got to go that way when you don't have the wide receivers. Yeah. Get Cam Meredith healthy. Uh, get, uh, if Don Clemson is a free agent, re sign him to a one or two year deal. He had great rapport with Trubisky when they were on the field together. And then 
see what you can get out of Kevin White because if you get anything that's a bonus, but then also look to draft a wide receiver, just need playmakers. I like the direction the Bears are headed. If Matt Nagy does not work out, Kim and Ryan Pace are both fun. So then the Bears are back over at square one. So I like how I like how he went out and got the guys he wanted. I just think it was a really quick hire. Like he, he wanted to hire this guy or that guy. Or, or talk to this guy or that guy, but as soon as he talked to Maggie, uh, he, he decided he was the guy. So I'm not going to go too much into why, you know, I think Pace gave up the gun too too bad on uh, too much on that. But you know, Maggie had uh, Mitchell Trubisky in Chiefs camp for seven hours before the draft, talking to him, taking detailed notes. So he has got a lot of background on Trubisky, which is huge. Yeah, I know they're going to work well together. Well, just keep in mind too. Get him, get, right, just give him the weapons that he needs. Well, and 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 to keep two things in mind here: one, you can get weapons in the later rounds. The Rams proved it. And two, sometimes, sometimes you interview the guy, you know that's the guy. That's what the Rams did with McVay. They didn't need a, right. They didn't need to go look at other people. I thought that was a quick hire, and it worked out. So, I mean, just, sometimes you just you know what you're looking for, and when you find it, you don't want to let it go. Yeah. Um, and- I hear you on, um, you know, Detroit, uh, Detroit's favoring Matt Patricia and, you know, McDaniels as well uh, for the Giants or, or maybe somewhere else. But, you know, unsure at this point. But I think those teams are going to be waiting for a while. And you know how teams stop, start getting antsy if, if the coordinators that they want to name as their head coach, as we've seen this in the past, that if the Patriots go to the Super Bowl, uh, okay, they can't hire uh, Patricia and McDaniels until February 5th. You know, these, a lot of these organizations want their guys in almost as soon as possible, okay? I, I think that if uh, New England were to lose, to, uh, lose tonight, that those two coordinators have head coaching jobs the next day. But because Detroit's going to have to wait, you know, I think they start talking around. I think they also start uh, interviewing some other people. But, you know, they, 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 they tend to get antsy. And I hope that's not the case because if, if that's who your guy is, you're going to wait for him. Well, I'll tell you why if I don't Detroit, think... If Detroit really wants Patricia, they're going to wait for him. I was just going to say, I mean, if you look at what the, the, the 49ers did waiting for Shanahan, right? What happened when they got a quarterback? Dude didn't lose a game. So you've got... Andrew Luck in Indianapolis. You've got Eli Manning in New York. You've got um, Matthew Stafford in Detroit. Wait. Because you've got your quarterback. If these coordinators are as good as you think they are and they can take over and be the head coach and you've got the quarterback in place, you've got the system in place to win right now. Um, I'm telling you, Eric, I think there's a lot of underlining steam here. We're going to find out really quickly if – The story about the friction between Kraft and Belichick is legit or not over the Garoppolo trade. If it's legit, Bill Belichick will be the next head coach for the New York football giants. If it's not legit, he stays in New England. I'm just telling you right now. I think the Giants are going to wait for one of those two coordinators or maybe drop a bombshell. And I do think Belichick in New York would do three things. One... I think it would cement his legacy as a head coach if he could win a Super Bowl with Eli, having won one with Peyton Man or with Tom Brady. Um, two, I think it would be a big middle finger to Kraft going, okay, you took a 40-year-old quarterback over me. Now you've got none of my coordinators and your 41-year-old quarterback. Good luck. And two, I think it gives Tom Brady an opportunity to cement his legacy if he's able to lead the Patriots to the playoffs with a whole new coaching staff. So I think this could be a win-win-win for all three parties involved. And I think it would be a win for the NFL too because you kind of break up that machine in New England and give other people an opportunity. And let's face it, Belichick in New York, that makes the Giants an immediate threat to win it. Yeah, for some reason, I I think this whole story is – is made up crap, to be honest with you. I know, I know the uh, journalist who, who wrote the story said that he was with uh, 
he had been you know, following or, or with the Patriots for uh, for two months. Now the whole Alex Guerrero thing, I think, is is pretty legit. But you know, it's a guy that Brady works with. Okay, great. He got his. He got some you know privileges revoked. Boo hoo. Okay, great. Who cares? But as far as like everything else, like when they're like, oh yeah, Brady cheered uh, Garoppolo getting traded. That you're you're one of the you know top quarterbacks of all time. You know. There's no reason to be to be jealous of, of a guy who's back to up for two or three years. Okay, um, yeah, you're going to go out on your own terms. I, I've said that before, and I'll keep saying it. You're going to go out on your own terms. You you're going to know when your days are numbered or over. Okay. Now, do I think there's there's some validity to um, you know the Browns wanting Garoppolo? Absolutely. Oh, heck yeah. If you, if you didn't want Garoppolo, either you were set a quarterback for a long time or uh, you just didn't you just didn't care, you didn't want to deal with New England. I can, I can sense New England, uh, and, and I, can, I, I understand where New England's coming from saying, we're not going to trade you to Cleveland because we're not going to do that to you. We respect you. We're going to trade you to an NFC team because we don't want to see you in the NFC. I can see them doing that. You know, Bill Belichick can, you know, has that type of mindset where he's like, how can we avoid this situation the most. And call it what you will that, you know, now all those stories come out. I know you said that to me before, but to me, it's like, you know, they're taking care of not only him, they're taking care of themselves. They just need now to, to get some quarterbacks in to back up Brady for another year or two, and then they can potentially move on. Now, if all this, if all this crap hits the fan and that, and that ends up coming out true, you know, we'll be here and we'll talk about it, okay? And I'll say, okay, well, this, I thought it was crap. It wasn't. And I was wrong. Um, and if Belichick leaves, I, I, I guess I wouldn't be surprised if Brady retired, depending on what happens at the end of the season for that. Uh, but that leaves Brian Hoyer as the only quarterback in New England. Well, and, let, let, me, let, me, let me just start with this, okay? Steve Young and Joe Montana couldn't stand each other. And... Joe Montana, if there was any quarterback in NFL history that had the right to write the way they wanted to end their career, it was Joe Montana. And guess what? He didn't get that opportunity. So I do believe that Tom Brady cheered Garoppolo going because I know for a fact, as a head coach, you're looking at Tom Brady going, I'll give you another year, maybe two, but this kid's starting quarterback in the future. And I'm not going to risk... 20 more years of success or 10, 15 more years of success for two years of immediate success because your times are num- your days are numbered. And I think the only one that could have stopped that is the owner. Just like in San Francisco, the only one that could have stopped that was the owner. But unlike Kraft, or I should say DeBartolo, Kraft chose the quarterback, not the head coach. DeBartolo chose Seaford, not Joe Montana. I'm sorry, but that's obviously what happened. If he did cheer. Um, It doesn't mean that Belichick's guaranteed to leave, but I would be surprised if he didn't cheer that trade because Tom Brady knew he's the guy for the next, until he chooses to be the guy, not to be the guy anymore. With Garoppolo there, there was always the risk of being pressured to retire and give way to the young new kid. But with him out of the equation... No one's asking so you, Tom Brady to retire for Brian Hoyer. So are you are you saying this is a, a Far Rogers saga part two? Yeah, I think it's a Joe Montana Steve Young part two. I think it's a Far Rogers part two. Absolutely, except instead of the quarterback being the one to go, I think you're going to see the coach for the first time ever be the one to go. Now Belichick may stay, but at that point, I think if he does stay, then his Theory is going to be, I'm going to stay until he retires because I'm not grooming another young set of quarterbacks like I've done and and be forced to, you know, start from scratch. So if he stays, he's going to stay till Brady retires. If he goes, it's because of this. But whether or not it happened or not, I agree with you on this front. I think we'll have an answer. If he stays in New England, I think there's a very good possibility that this whole thing is bogus as far as Kraft telling Belichick, Belichick no. Um, and it's just going to be a really stupid blunder by the New England Patriots. And they're not infallible. They're stupid. And they made a mistake 
like most franchises make, they chose poorly. If Belichick does leave, I think we could say that this story had some legs. That's kind of where I'm at. So either New England did something really stupid. We'll find out once the Patriots season ends. Because I think they're already going to lose two coordinators. We'll see if it keeps continuing up to the top. That would be interesting. That would be interesting. Any other news you want to add? Uh, yeah, actually. Um, I want to give a, a shout-out to um, Keith Jackson. He uh, died last night, uh, one of the greatest broadcasters that I've ever yeah. had the opportunity to listen to. He was 89 years old. Uh, you know, if, if YouTube some old Pat, Pat 10 games, he, he was always out there out west. Uh, it was a great listen to you called the first ever Monday Night Football game. I uh, just want to uh, throw a shout out to to him. And uh, other than that, um, you know, we're getting down to the uh, big time of the playoffs. And there should be four more good games this weekend. And next week's championship week. And, uh, you know, there, there could be a lot of good storylines going in there. Um, possibly... Uh, three out of four NFC teams. I don't think Philly gets there, but uh, three out of the other four. And then, uh, you know, I think in the AFC, it's really anybody's game. Right? You know, Tennessee can't up, can't upset New England. Jacksonville could be Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh could be Jacksonville. Uh, I think we're going to see some good matches. I, I don't think you – I think you're going to get a, a very uncon, unconventional uh, Super Bowl as well. That would be nice. It would be nice to have a change of pace in 2017. All right. Well, I'm Anthony. That's Eric. And I'm Eric. That's right. And go Rams!